thank you very much for the introduction and for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, well, it, it's an honor to be here for all kinds of reasons. As I said to a couple of you earlier, first and foremost, the mountains are beautiful, so I'm very envious of the wonderful surroundings you guys have. But back to when I was a, a grad student and trying to understand how pulse lasers work, I remember these really famous people, Captain Murnane, and then when I was a postdoc, we were we had a project involving liquid crystals, so it was Dave Walba, and all of these people obviously are here. And uh, we started getting into beam shaping and some work I'm gonna talk about, so we used a lot of work from the Rensepis group, and the names just keep going on. And I know the recent science publication by Rob McLeod's group, so there's a lot of really good people here. So it's an honor for me to be here and meet the grad students that are actually doing the work. Um, and so compliment you on choosing a great program and being in a great environment and doing a lot of good work. I got to see a couple of the labs today and find out what some of the frontier research is that you guys are doing. It's very, very exciting, it's envious. Um, so um, I'm gonna tell you about um, an area that we got started in a couple of years back, and it's, I'm gonna talk all about theoretical work. We've started moving toward applications, and then unfortunately, my grad student had to go on to better things. So I'm looking to recruit another grad student to keep it going. So I'm gonna talk mostly about simulations and method development that we did, uh, and, and why we were inspired to move in that direction. So before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about where I come from. So there's Florida, right? And then if we zoom in, uh, there's Orlando. And the greater Orlando area really just kind of spills out into where I'm circling. And over here is where they launch uh, rockets from, including the space shuttle. So that's going to go away, but they'll continue launching rockets from there. And that's very exciting because here on the top of the chemistry building, you can see those when they go up. Um, I'm hoping to get up close and, and, and see one pretty soon. And the other reason to come to Florida, uh, besides seeing my lab, of course, is to see this guy. Um, and so all of the theme parks and whatnot are uh, just south of Orlando proper. Um, but UCF is located right here uh, near uh, kind of a subsumed uh, city on the periphery of uh, Orlando called uh, Oviedo, still part of the Orlando metropolitan area. And if we zoom in, that's what our campus looks like a couple of years ago. I couldn't find a more up-to-date picture. Um, so there's been a lot of build-out recently in this direction. They built a football stadium and a lot of other things, which, to be perfectly honest, don't uh, intrigue me that much. But students and alums like them. So anyway, uh, we've been putting a lot of sports facilities out here. Um, but also, we've been building out uh, some of the, the facilities for research. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but the university is very, very young. It was established in 1963. Uh, now we are up to 56,000 students. So we're the second or third largest university in the country, believe it or not. Um, about almost 2,000 faculty, 29 graduate programs, and pretty decent research funding given that we don't have a medical school with which to collaborate. You get so much more um, um, research funding if you can do biological applications, obviously, and we've just started a medical school and the first class started in 09, so that's really exciting uh, for our area. There's quite a need and there'll be a lot of interesting ways for us to, to interact with the medical school, particularly in biophotonics. There's two million people in the greater uh, Orlando area total. and. Uh, Creole, uh, the College of Optics and Photonics, this is the, the building. Um, we have about uh, 40 faculty. We have an MS and PhD program in optical sciences. There's some 40 courses on the books in optics and photonics. It's typically a five to six year program, uh, about 120 graduate students and about 100,000 square feet of space. Uh, the chemistry department is um, a much younger program in terms of the PhD. That was only started in 03, so it's really a fledgling program. And I have a joint appointment in both, so I train graduate students from both units. Um, but we've just constructed a new physical science building. Um, and see, there's some of my very happy students. And our labs are gonna be in this wing, so we're really looking forward to, to going in there. And that will house both physics and chemistry, so there should be a lot of really good synergy between those two units. Okay, so this is just a quick outline for my talk. Um, I'm going to tell you as, uh, a little bit of the motivation for why we are interested in studying high numerical aperture uh, beam shaping, and then I'm going to provide some data that will hopefully convince you of what I think is a real necessity if you're going to work in this area for using uh, vectorial theory rather than scalar theory, um, although scalar theory can, can be a good way to get halfway to the answer, um, but I'll, I'll show you what our thinking had been. And then I'll show you some methods that we used uh, for designing uh, diffractive optical elements that can allow you to change the axial point spread function. And then I'll show you a method that we used to try to do some transverse beam shaping. Okay, 
So the reason we got into this is um, we, we've done some work similar to maybe Rob McLeod's group where we use uh, multi-photon excitation for uh, direct three-dimensional direct laser writing. Um, and we're using very much the, the uh, more traditional method, not a two-beam method, where we have a single beam uh, that creates localized excitation limited by uh, the diffraction limited spot size that you can achieve upon focusing with a high NA objective. And <coughs> in my group, we've used that to prepare uh, photonic materials, photonic crystals and such, and we've tried to contribute toward the development of different material systems, specifically uh, chemistries for metallizing uh, polymeric lattices so that we can transfer the optical properties from being that of a dielectric photonic crystal to a, a metal photonic crystal. Um, and so we, we have ongoing work in this area. But I'm not going to discuss that today. What I'm going to say is that we were, you know, we've always and others have been uh, concerned with the fact that when you focus the laser beam into the sample, um, the, the minimum resolution that you can achieve and therefore the smallest types of structures and feature sizes that you can make is really determined by that diffraction limited focal spot that you can create. So this is a simulation using vector diffraction theory of the uh, point spread function that you can achieve under high NA focusing with a 1.4 NA objective. And this is actually an X, uh, Z slice. So this is in the axial direction or along the direction of beam propagation. And this is transverse in the X direction. Uh, nominally, if you rotated that thing, you'd get the three-dimensional distribution, although because of polarization, that's not quite accurate. There is a little bit of asymmetry to it. And we, we may talk about that a little bit more. But notice that that's rugby ball shaped. So when you fabricate with that, you typically make features, as I'll show, that are, are have an aspect ratio width to length that are anywhere from two to four, depending upon which group is doing it and how the material system responds. And it's in part because uh, to first order, the, the polymerized feature that you may make depends upon the region in the uh, intensity distribution that crosses the polymerization threshold. So in terms of the photochemical response of the system, that represents the point where the integrated photo exposure generates sufficient initiating species to overcome uh, any terminating species, be they inhibitors that you've uh, purposefully added or ad are ad adventitiously present, maybe from adsorbed oxygen, for example, if it's a free radical process. So this is a photonic crystal structure that we've made. That's a perspective view of a scanning electron micrograph. And then this is a view looking down the rods. So really coming in and uh, looking parallel to the substrate. It's a stack of logs type structure. And so each one of these little rugby ball shaped features is one of the rods viewed end on. And you can see it you know, kind of magically really does have that same uh, shape that the, uh, that the um, irradiance distribution has. And we would like to be able to get to uh, smaller structures and better resolution. And having something that's more of a spherical shape would be a good step in that direction. There's a lot of things that I think you could think about doing uh, in terms of beam shaping in one and two beam geometries. OK, so the question was, how could we reshape the intensity profile? And the answer in the literature was to do beam shaping using diffractive optical elements, or sometimes they're called pupil filters. They go by sim so many different names, or masks, phase masks, amplitude masks. But these are basically optics that you can put in front of a lens to alter the wavefront, either in terms of phase, amplitude, or polarization, so that upon focusing, you get a different irradiance distribution at the focal plane. And indeed, the irradiance distribution is, of course, affected out of the focal plane. You change the entire propagation of the beam. And that's been used to a lot of good advantage particularly in low NA applications as uh, beam splitters to make multiple spots for beam shaping. So you might take a uh, homogeneous flat top beam or a Gaussian profile uh, and, and reshape it into something that could look like letters or what have you, uh, or even uh, shaping a beam from, say, a Gaussian to a, a flat top distribution or beam homogenizing, which can be very useful for various applications where you're uh, treating or processing materials, laser soldering, for example. OK, so the challenge I gave to this poor guy, uh, Tufik Jabour, but nope, now it says doctor, so it couldn't have been all that bad. He just uh, graduated last year. Um, I, the challenge I gave to Tufik was, let's figure out how to design uh, phase masks or DOEs that could axially super resolve uh, our high NA focused beam. So our initial uh, goal was to take that rugby ball profile and squeeze it so we get something a little more spherical. And we were certainly going to pay attention to what happened in transverse directions, but to first order, we weren't going to worry about uh, our lack of control there. We we're just going to try to see what we could do in terms of the axial dimension. So we thought about this, and there's an enormous uh, space of possibilities in terms of the diffractive optical elements that you could use um, because you can control polarization phase or amplitude. And so we decided at first, let's just do phase masks. And the reason for that is uh, if we want to use or have available at the sample as much optical power as possible, 
we thought we should use phase masks rather than amplitude masks, which would attenuate the beam. Secondly, uh, phase masks can be analog phase distributions that can, where the phase can be varied from 0 to 2 pi across the wavefront. Um, or a lot of folks have done things related to binary phase masks, where you might have zones, uh, maybe concentric rings, for example, where the phase has a binary profile, 0 pi, 0 pi, across these rings. And we said, okay, first, again, to make it simple, let's just look at binary phase masks. Um, and also this has the advantage that we could then go and fabricate some of these structures more readily than trying to use some sort of gray tone uh, fabrication to make an analog phase mask. Um, thirdly, we decided we would try to work with radially symmetric uh, phase masks, again, for, um, uh, for simplicity. But we would uh, still have a lot of degrees of freedom, and the problem really is computationally intense in this regard, because the number of uh, zones that we might have was not going to be inherently limited. Uh, and um, the, the phases here could alternate 0 pi uh, in any pattern. So if you think about it, if I, had, if I decided to have a 100 zone, uh, if I wanted to have a problem where I might think about having 100 different zones, and I didn't know whether each zone going from the center out to the uh, perimeter was going to be 0 or pi, then I have 2 to the 100 possible diffractive optical elements. So there's, um, there's a design problem there to think about. Okay. Um, we also decided that we really needed to use vector diffraction theory. So why? Um, so here's the reason in short. We, we always think about light as you know, a transverse electromagnetic wave and it propagates in one direction, so the electric field is always orthogonal to the direction of propagation. So you might say then, if I start off with a linearly polarized excitation beam at the focus, I should have a linearly polarized spot. Um, but in fact, you don't. You have a mix of polarization. You can start off with a totally expolarized beam, and you know, it's perfectly clean, and you use the best polarizers and all the rest of it. And at the focus, you can show that you'll have a mix of x, y, and z polarization. Okay? And why does that occur? Well, it occurs in part if that you have a very high numerical aperture objective. What you're doing, if you think about rays, is the lens is bending the wave fronts, or therefore bending the direction that the rays propagate. So after it passes through the lens, the electric field now takes on a considerable z component, for example. And there's a bit of a y component, too, if you come out of the x, z plane. So how significant is that, Steve? Well, it turns out that the peak intensity in the uh, z direction can be 16% of that of the, the uh, x polarized beam. And if you integrate the power, about 24% of the optical power is actually z polarized. So it's non-negligible, okay? or at least from that standpoint. Okay, and this is, we remember the rugby ball shape that I showed you? That was the full uh, irradiance distribution with containing the x, y, and z component. If you look at just the x polarized component in the irradiance distribution, uh, it still has that rugby ball shape. Now I've turned the plot over, so don't get too confused. This is the axial direction, and this is a transverse coordinate. But if you look at the z, the z polarized component, um, it actually has two lobes, and it's stretched out a little bit more. So in fact, the irradiance that you see and the irradiance that you use in an unaligned sample is just a vector sum of all of these fields. So this actually tends to spread out your irradiance distribution and actually extend it in the transverse direction as well. So it's significant. It's something that we should maybe be worried about. OK, so we wanted to go further, though, because just because I say it's 16% in terms of peak irradiance or 24% in power, that doesn't mean you know, that it's, it's necessarily going to hurt design of diffractive optical elements. So one of the simple things that we did was is we took the full-blown vector diffraction theory. And I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about how that calculation is done. But we chose a, a simple three-zone DOE. This was not one that was in any way optimized for axial squeezing. Okay? It's very arbitrarily chosen to have uh, normalized radii for the first, second, and third zone of about 0.43 and 0.69. And the phases of these zones were 0, pi, 0. And what we did is we calculated what the axial uh, irradiance distribution would look like as a function of numerical aperture. So if we go back to that earlier slide, if we have very low NA, then this angle is very small. So the amount of that which the electric field vector is inclined in the z direction is small. So you would imagine far less significant z component. But as the NA gets higher, that z and even the y component becomes more significant. So we wanted to just simply study how much that would affect uh, an axial distribution as a function of numerical aperture. So we calculated the axial irradiance. So this is 0 is going through the focal plane. Um, and the uh, blue is what we get with scalar theory, which is what a lot of people would use to design DOEs. Uh, 
and the red is the electromagnetic calculation. What you can see is that for low NA, 0.2, they agree fairly well. But now as you start to increase the NA, the agreement starts to get poorer and poorer. Okay, and when you get to 0.9 NA, now you notice that you've got a lot more uh, side lobes here until when you get to 1.4 NA where we want it to work, they, they don't really agree at all. I mean, qualitatively, you could say you have a similar amount of lumpiness, but look, if we think about the depth of field here, uh, in fact, interestingly, the depth of field is much longer for this DOE under the EM calculation than the scalar calculation. Okay? So it really tells you, um, you, you may think you will do better than in fact you do experimentally. So my student and I did this and we got out a little cheeky paper here because it really, in our minds, wasn't expressed in the literature uh, quite loudly enough. So we published these results and then said, okay, what, what can we do about it? So here's the rest of the talk is what we can do about it. Um, the challenge then uh, in designing a diffractive optical element for any kind of beam shaping uh, is multifold. We've decided we want to incorporate this uh, vector theory, um, and that has uh, a number of difficulties that I'm going to come to. If we knew the shape of the diffractive optical element, it's fairly straightforward to calculate the point spread function. You can take the Wolf-Richards integrals, which are these things, and you can evaluate them. Now, I'm a chemist, and chemists get very, very squeamish when you start to throw integrals at them. Uh, at, at them. So, you know, this is about as mathematically intense as I care to stomach, but there you have it. This is what you need to do. And the point is that you can calculate both the electric field and the magnetic field around the region of the focus at some point, uh, not too many Rayleigh ranges away. And what you can put in here, in fact, is a phase function. And this theory was actually developed by Wolf in order to predict what a point spread function would look like in the case of aberration. So this phase function can be an arbitrary aberration or it can be our diffractive optical element, which we can think of as a controlled aberration. And what this basically does is it evaluates the accumulated phase that you get due to the phase aberration and that due to any arbitrary point around the focus. And if you have a perfect lens, what the, what the lens would do if it were perfect is really transform a planar wavefront to a spherical wavefront for which all of the rays converge to the focus. Now, no lens is perfect. It always has aberration, and that could be part of this phase function. Nonetheless, if you have your diffractive optical element, you could express it in terms of this function phi, and you could calculate your field exactly. The thing is, we don't have the diffractive optical element, right? What we have is some uh, conjured notion of what our irradiance distribution should look like. Okay? And in fact, it's a rather ill-defined ill -defined problem to the point where mathematicians call this an ill-defined problem because you can, <laughs> you can choose an irradiance distribution. You can draw it and describe it, but it's not necessarily a solution to the wave equation. So again, for a chemist, gee, what does that mean? Well, what that really means is it's just not physical. Okay? The waves can't necessarily interfere to give you that profile. But what you can do is you can say, all right, I know I want to squeeze the axial distribution, and I don't know exactly what the irradiance distribution would look like, but I can start to now define some parameters or maybe some constraints, as they're called, which uh, define how the irradiance distribution should be modified upon focusing. And that can then be a starting point for the design of a DOE. Now, the problem is also complicated by the fact um, that you kind of go from a 2D input to a 3D output, if you will. This is a 2D profile that modifies the field, and the field distribution here has a three-dimensional shape. Okay, so you're looking for a 2D object that gives you a 3D shape. And there's not really lost information in there. The information there is that the field distribution is modified in terms of the X, the Y, and the Z polarized field. So what you need to do is not just specify an irradiance distribution. Really what you must do to back calculate the DOE is ideally specify the electric field distribution in X, in Y, and Z, and also the phase. And you don't have that information. Again, it's an ill-defined problem. OK, well, that's OK, because Tufik was really good. So what we did is we first went into the literature and we found that people were using things called the method of generalized projections. And there's what is it, Gershberg, Saxton method, or projection onto convex sets. There's a couple of different uh, methods that are out there. There's also um, iterative Fourier transform analysis, or IFTA. Um, they're, they're all fairly similar in terms of the fact that you don't actually define exactly what your irradiance distribution should look like. Instead, what you do is you establish some constraints that tell you uh, how you would like it to reshape. Now, you acknowledge on the front end that you don't know exactly what the solution should, would be, should be. And so what happens is the constraints that you use to characterize the problem often do not overlap. Okay? So that's a little bit like saying you want to have your cake and eat it too. Right? Those are two constraints that are incompatible. 
maybe you could go halfway and eat half a cake, right? That satisfies two of the constraints. It's not a perfect solution to your problem, but it's halfway. A lot of these problems are similar. We can define constraints in a solution space that don't perfectly overlap, and so what we try to find is a diffractive optical element, a solution, that gives us the best or closest approximation, the best solution that comes closest to satisfying the two constraints. Even that becomes difficult. Imagine if we had three constraints. Now there may not be a single solution that satisfies all three um, uh, simultaneously. So in fact, your problems are best stated if we can take that axial squeezing that we want to do and define it in terms of just two constraints. Then you're, uh, then you're guaranteed to converge to a single solution. Now what method of projection, um, what generalized uh, projections method does is it goes back and forth between uh, the phase aberration or the DOE and the field distribution. So you need something like those uh, integrals that I showed you in order to propagate the field forward. You can have a starting point, which is a best guess at the diffractive optical element. And that could come from scalar theory, uh, in fact. And you use that to calculate the field distribution. That gives you an amplitude and a phase. Then the next step is to apply some field constraints. This is your first uh, projection of constraints. What you do is you say, well, I don't really care what this phase factor is, but I know what I want the amplitude to look like, or I know what I want the intensity to look like, so my amplitude will be roughly the you know, square root of that. And then you use that as a new field to come up with a new uh, field distribution, but you keep the phase. And this is actually a good thing. It provides some freedom for the calculation, okay? So you keep the phase. The next thing you need to do, and this is the tough part, is propagate backward. You need to have some way to go from that modified field back to the diffractive optical element. I'll tell you in a minute how we do that. After you get there, this is now a modified uh, phase element, and you have to apply a second set of constraints. Remember, I told Tufik I want a phase-only diffractive optical element. When I propagate backward, that's not guaranteed. Depending upon what calculation I use, this may affect both the amplitude and the phase of the diffractive optical element. So the second constraint is to just basically uh, keep the phase and throw away the amplitude, or set the amplitude to unity. Now that takes me away from this prescribed solution, but now I have a new starting point, which is ostensibly better, because I've impressed my preferred amplitude, and now I can go through the process again and continue to iterate, uh, applying projections in the focus field plane and the diffractive optical element plane, and evaluate some fitness function or cost function that tells me if I'm getting anywhere in the calculation. Okay, so these are the two difficult parts, so I'll tell you how uh, Tufik and I solved that. He found in the literature uh, some nice extension of Richard and Wolf's work uh, given by Rishi Kant. And what Rishi Kant said is that if you take the diffraction integrals and you look at just the uh, axial field distribution, you can express it this way. Okay, so this is a single integral, and this spans over uh, the angle uh, theta, which extends from zero to alpha. And alpha is just the maximum angle depending upon the numerical aperture of the lens you're using. So you're integrating over this uh, angular space. And what you put into the integrand is your diffractive optical element. So this tells it the phase aberration that you have. And what you get out is the axial field at some position along the optic axis. And you just evaluate this integral multiple times to build up the full uh, profile along the uh, optical axis. Okay, so that will let you propagate forward effectively. That lets you get the field at the focus. Excuse me. Now what Kant showed is that if you take the integrand, so that's everything here except for the exponential function, you can expand that as a set of Gegenbauer polynomials. Okay? And so those are things that fortunately you can look up in math world or Wikipedia or uh, Abramowitz and, and whatnot, um, or a good math book. But you can also evaluate the left-hand side of this integral, the electric field, as a sum of Bessel functions. And what's really interesting is do you see the A coefficients? The A coefficients tell you what the uh, linear combination of these orthogonal functions is that you need to best fit the integrand. And it turns out that the A coefficients are exactly the same. Okay? Um, and that's a property of the relationship between spherical Bessel functions of the first kind and Gegenbauer polynomials that you can look up in Kant's paper. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. But the upshot is that you have a targeted field distribution that you would like to have. So if you evaluate that, if you just curve fit it as a set of Bessel functions, you get A coefficients. And now if you take this expression and solve in terms of the diffractive optical element, all you're doing is bringing down these cosinusoidal functions. So now you have the DOE expressed as uh, the cosinusoidal functions and the expansion of the Gegenbauer polynomials, and now you drop in the A coefficients that you got from the expansion of the field.
So what this lets you do, it's pretty miraculous, what it lets you do is it lets you solve for what the diffractive optical element is based on two independent curve fits that both are coupled through a relationship between two sets of orthogonal functions. And it's really just a property of that axial irradiance distribution. So there's three papers by Kant where he describes this. And if you want to know more, really, you need to go read uh, his papers. But that allows us to propagate backward. Okay, that solves one of our problems. The constraint was the second set of problems. And so for the constraints, what we did is we wanted to provide as many degrees of freedom as possible. We knew we wanted an axial confinement, so we tried to define a narrow lobe at the focal plane as a cosine half cycle. In order to enforce it to be as narrow as possible, we picked a region, about a unit of lambda, where the field was defined as zero. And then any other region outside, excuse me, we allowed to be any value that it would take above a certain limit. Why did we do that? Well, you know that if you take a, a laser beam and you shine it through a slit, you get diffracted orders, right? That's what you see in the transverse field. But it's not dissimilar. If you put a diffractive optical element and you shine a laser beam through it and, and focus, um, if it is super resolving, if it's tending to squeeze that main lobe, you tend to generate some side lobes. And what's been shown, at least in the scalar literature, is that the more you try to squeeze axially, the bigger the side lobes become. So there seems to be a mutual exclusivity between axial super resolution and keeping side lobes t you know, at a controllable limit. This was important for us because remember I talked about a chemical threshold. If we generated side lobes in the course of trying to have an axial squeeze and those side lobes came above our intensity threshold, then we would start to generate features and we would lose our axial confinement. So we wanted to engineer into our constraints then a lot of freedom but a limit that said don't go above that polymerization threshold. This has wider applications. For imaging, for instance, you could use a confocal geometry that might, through a pinhole, block out any light that you get from that autofocal region. But in terms of an application-specific diff diffractive optical element, we really needed to have uh, that constraint. But this gives us some, some amplitude freedom in this region. It gives us phase freedom because we only care about the field uh, amplitude. And it also gives us scaling freedom because we're not defining the absolute irradiance. OK. so. Now we needed some cost functions. How do we define as this simulation is iterating in its loop, whether we're getting close to the right answer or not? Uh, and so there were already some performance parameters out there that we could take advantage of. I'll direct your attention to this graph, where we show in red what the uh, diffraction-limited profile is. And this is, again, the, the axial um, irradiance distribution. And the blue is just an example of some modified point spread function. Maybe it's one that has a little bit of improvement in the axial geometry. What we could do is define how much improvement we get in terms of a super resolution factor, or G. This is what people have typically used. And it's really just, um, there's many different ways to measurement, measure it. But as we defined it, it was a measure of the full width at half maximum uh, of the main lobe. So whatever that central lobe was or most intense, how wide was it as ratioed against that of the diffraction or limit or unmodified distribution? Secondly, uh, how big are those side lobes? That's the parameter M. And that, again, is just a ratio of the main lobe divided, or sorry, the um, second highest lobe divided by the main lobe. And we didn't put a, uh, any kind of assignment on where that main lobe would occur. You can actually come up with diffractive optical elements that will cause the main lobe to go down and big side lobes to appear. Okay. And then we have a thing called the Strel ratio, which is just how much the absolute irradiance of the main lobe decreases. So for our super resolution, what we would want is the smallest value of G. G starts off at unity, and as soon as you modify the field's distribution, G could go above one, which is in the wrong direction. G could go below one, which is improved super resolution. And we wanted the side lobe intensity, M, to be as small as possible. You can see for the diffraction limit, M is around 0.04. Okay? But as we begin to super resolve, M goes up. OK, so how, how, what does it look like when the iteration, when the, the algorithm is running? So this is a little movie. Movies are good to wake everyone up. I love movies. Um, um, and what we're going to see in this movie is a plot of the diffractive optical element. Okay? So to orient you, this is the phase profile in the vertical direction. And this is the radial direction. So this is at the center of the DOE, the optic axis. And this goes out to the normalized radius unity. So this profile starts off with one, two, three, four, five zones that are zero and pi in phase. And that, in fact, generates the distribution you see in blue. So you can see that's nowhere near close to what we want. Okay? But there's a starting point. And red, again, is the uh, diffraction-limited axial distribution. 
So as I run it, what you're going to see is the, the blue distribution changing and hopefully getting more super resolved uh, than the red one. Of course, I've seen this, so you know it's going to happen, right? Um, but you're going to see the phase profile change. Remember when I said when the algorithm runs, there's nothing that a priori prevents you from getting a DOE that's both analog um, uh, and, and amplitude, right? Except that we're throwing away the, uh, throwing away the uh, amplitude change. Well, in fact, the Kant method that I described will give us initially an analog phase distribution. So halfway through the algorithm, we're going to force it to binarize. What that means is whatever the analog change would be between 0 and 2 pi, we're going to start to apply the algorithm, but now forcing the phase to go down toward 0 at its lowest points and up toward pi. So eventually, you'll start to see some steps appear. OK. Go movie. OK, so it's running. There's a whole bunch of extra zones in there. right? And you can see also it's starting to take on an analog shape, but you can already see there's some super resolution there with side lobes that are being held to a level of around 0.6 or below. So it's keeping these side lobes down, and it's keeping this thing su super resolved. Now look in this region. You see how we're starting to get a step function? Now binarization has started to happen. So at all points, the phase distribution is being forced down to either 0 or toward pi. And regions that are around 2, that's 2 pi. If you unfold that, that's the same as 0 phase shift overall. So eventually this whole thing is going to binarize out at 200 iterations and unwrap a little bit. OK, and now it's finished. And what you can see is we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 zones overall. This is 2 pi, so that unwraps to 0 again. So it really is a 0 pi phase uh, diffractive optical element overall. And the irradiance distribution is now super resolved a little bit by about 30%. And the side lobes are kept to about 50%. So in theory, you can do it. right? And the algorithm runs pretty quickly. This was only 200 iterations. So what does it look like in terms of the irradiance plots? This is the diffraction limited profile. And this is the super resolved profile. And in the plot that you saw previously, we were just looking at the irradiance down the optic axis. But now you can see what's happening in the transverse direction. And you can see that al although we have squeezed the distribution and generated some side lobes, we haven't taken much a of a hit at all in the transverse distribution, which is quite nice. And apparently, that's a property of symmetric gratings. And you have to go read deeper to explain that a little bit. Um, but you can actually super resolve axially if you can tolerate side lobes without sacrificing too much in the transverse direction. It's about 2 to 3% expanded. OK, so that's described uh, in this paper if you want to learn more about it. OK, there's a problem, though, with method of generalized projection. So we wanted to explore other methods. And one of these is we don't know if that's, in fact, a global solution. We have this big solution space, right? And there can be these things called local minima, which might be pretty good solutions, but not the best. And in fact, you never know if that's the case with any of these projection methods, because you have these sets of constraints. And even this would be the ideal case where we, they overlap, so there really is a best solution. But you can run into these situations called traps. They are what put you in local minima solutions where you begin to project back and forth, back and forth, and you find some point here that seems to be a best solution. But you never go further and find this absolute best solution, because if you move out in this space, you're moving away from satisfying this constraint. Your answer is getting worse. Okay? It's a little bit like just not having enough energy to get out of a valley to go up over the peak to the next lowest valley. So MGP suffers from this, uh, and a lot of the iterative methods do in general. You can also have what are called tunnels. And these are just places where even if this, the constraint is convex, so they may overlap together, the gradient or the change in the constraint may be very, very shallow. So you're going through many, many iterations in computation time, and seemingly your answer is never getting any better, so you stop. But in fact, you might have, there may be a better solution. So we wanted to find a better approach. And in the literature, we found what I think is this really inspiring method called uh, particle swarm optimization. Um, anything that nature does, I think, is really cool when we can apply it to science, right? And the idea is that if you watch birds or maybe uh, schooling fish, they're kind of moving independently, but kind of not, right? Uh, birds are doing what birds do, which I, first and foremost, they're looking for food, right? And staying away from enemies. Um, and everyone's looking for the best source of food, I guess, I don't know. Um, but they're kind of watching each other because they're moving as uh, a group, but with some level of independence. So it's like there's a social connection between them that allows them to explore the food space uh, while still keeping together as a group. And so a couple of folks um, early on applied this to, um, well, Kennedy and Abenhart applied this to, um, to complicated problems where you're looking in a vast solution space with the notion that rather than using something like a Monte Carlo method where you randomly sample, 
maybe what you would do is have multiple particles that initially randomly sample, but they communicate between one another. And so the particles can have knowledge of where the best solution was found by any other in the ensemble. And that can help pull the whole of the group so they gravitate toward the best solution. And then you put in enough random motion that allows the individual particles to hop out of local minima. So you avoid local minima in two ways. One, you have a large enough set of particles at the beginning that you hopefully sample the space and, identif and come close to various minima. And secondly, you communicate between them and have a random number generator that helps kick them out of local minima. Okay? So you might have several local minima, and as the particles start exploring, they may gravitate initially toward two solutions, but this solution is the best, and it tends to pull those particles toward it. And then having a large number of particles is also useful because, uh, again, you can explore a solution space uh, more quickly, although computation time is really number of iterations times particles. Okay, so I'll show you in the nitty-gritty how that can be implemented. The interesting thing is you can do both analog and binary problems. Remember, we wanted a binary phase grading, um, and so that takes a little bit of massaging, but you can do this with analog and binary problems. You set up three terms that define uh, the motion of your bird or your particle. I'll call them particles from here forward. And each particle has a position, and it is updated in terms of a velocity. The velocity tells it where it's going to update to on the next iteration. And the velocity has three different terms in it. One is called the inertia term. And that's just basically that particle is moving in this direction and it wants to keep going that way. Okay, so it's exploring its local space. Um, and so it has uh, an inertia associated with it. And you add to that uh, a so-called cognitive term, which is kind of that particle's memory of where the best solution was that it found. Okay, so it might have found the best solution here and it's moving in this direction, but if it's not getting any better, there's a tug to go back and explore that local space more thoroughly. In addition to the cognitive term, there's a social learning term, and this is just a communication between particles where the velocity is affected by the best solution found overall um, by the, the whole of the ensemble. Each one of these then uh, adds to the total velocity and determines the trajectory of the particle in the solution space. You can have random number generators that help alter the velocity to explore the, the direction and the velocity locally. Yeah. All right. How do you can so that that makes sense if I had an analog distribution, right? Because if I had a diffractive optical element, that may translate into a phase that for every zone goes from zero to two pi. So I could be exploring all the phase distributions between zero and pi. How do I translate that to a binary DOE? Well, if you want to do the binary problem, what you do is you replace um, velocities by a probability function. So the probability, instead of being a velocity and, and therefore an absolute phase, the probability now tells you the likelihood that the DOE zone should be zero or pi phase. Okay? And how do we approach the problem? Remember the integral that I showed you that gave you the axial field? It turns out convenient to actually divide the DOE space into many tiny zonelets, literally up to 100 zones, okay? so that each one is about 50 microns uh, wide. And what we can then do is evaluate the whole integral at the, the beginning so that we calculate what the axial field or what the contribution of the axial field is due to each one of the zonelets from the inner uh, center closest to the optic axis all the way out to uh, the periphery. So what we then have is kind of a basis function that tells us what the field will be at any point along the optic axis, just, just depending upon whether zones 0 through 99 are 0 or pi phase. And all a 0 or pi phase shift does is flip the electric field. It changes the sign from positive to negative. So this is literally like a combinatorial problem now where our particles are zooming around in a probability space trying to determine how to flip the fields here, zero, um, positive or negative, positive or negative, to get the best overall field distribution. So we can define each diffractive optical element then as an n-bit binary vector. And then what we can do is we can have our uh, inertia term and our, uh, our uh, particle best term and our global best term uh, in terms of uh, a probability function. And what we can do is we can compare each one of those now using a binary operation, an exclusive or, rather than uh, a sum or difference. The probabilities here can vary from negative infinity to positive infinity. So functionally, we use the sigmoid to transform that from a zero to one. And when we evaluate the probability, we compare it to a random number generator. If the probability ends up being high, much greater than that random number, then we change the zone for that uh, 
for that zone of the DOE. If it was zero, it changes to pi. If it's pi, we change it back to zero. Um, and if the probability was low, then we don't change it. And we keep iterating uh, around that way, uh, changing each zone. So what does that do for us? Um, the only other thing to add is that we're doing that as we iterate and we compare the fitness for every diffractive optical element in terms of the super resolution factor and in terms of the minimum tolerable side lobes. So what's nice here is that we can run this calculation multiple times where we let the side lobes vary from 0.5 down to 0.4 or any limit therein. Okay, so this is a result that we got uh, in the case where we forced uh, the side lobes to go no higher than 0.5 and we asked what is the best super resolution that we could find. Uh, and after a few hundred iterations, it gave us this result, which looks very, very similar to what I showed you with method of generalized projections, but now the super resolution is a little bit better. It's 0.66 instead of 0.7, uh, and the side lobe intensity is now 0.5 instead of 0.52. Okay, so you actually get a better solution, which implies that the one we had from MGP was not, in fact, uh, a global solution. But what's nice with this is that you can also run the iteration multiple times and define what is called the Pareto front. Who's ever heard of Pareto? Yeah? Okay. Uh, good, because you guys are doing this sort of thing. Pareto, believe it or not, is some guy who comes out of economics. So in economic theory, they do these kinds of optimizations where they want to figure out things like distribution of wealth. If you want to make an economy grow, and this is a problem we're really dealing with now in this country, if you want to make an economy grow, do we have higher tax or lower tax? Okay, if we have higher tax, then the money can go to the government, maybe we can distribute it to to programs, and maybe that'll help grow the economy. Or do we have lower tax, and then hopefully people invest? You know, and maybe that grows the economy. How do you optimize? What, which, which do you do? Because you can't have both simultaneously. So this Italian economist Pareto developed some models and what he said is that I have various functions similar to our super resolution versus side lobes and these are mutually exclusive parameters. So what he said is that in addition to my solution space, I have a cost function space. And if I choose one of those uh, parameters to have uh, a highest limit, that will automatically lock in what the highest limit is for one of my other parameters. And so there's many, many solutions, but there's a boundary in the solution space, which corresponds to the Pareto front. And that is just the best solutions that I can find once I fix one of the constraints. So we ran this multiple times uh, with our PSO calculation. And what it showed, I think, is something that people had thought about and stated in the literature without proof, that side lobes and super resolution really are indeed mutually exclusive parameters. And in fact, the diffraction limit corresponds to m being about 0.04, so that gives you g of 1. As you let the side lobes get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can get better super resolution. And potentially, this may approach some asymptotic limit. I don't know. We didn't go further than that. But the higher you allow the side lobes to be, the more super resolution that you can get. Okay. Okay, all of that was uh, axial uh, field shaping. We're generally interested in 3D beam shaping, so this is gonna be a very short uh, introduction to this and then I'll end. Um, and here, what we're showing is things that we did in terms of transverse beam shaping. So notice the, uh, the paper down here that really motivated us to, to think about this in the first place. Some very nice work with scalar theory showed that you can actually apply constraints at multiple planes in the direction that a beam is propagating and make an irradiance distribution that changes shape, having this cross pattern that rotates uh, in space. So that was really inspirational to us. And what we wanted to do first was see how we could apply vector diffraction theory, so a full vector calculation, trying to work out a field distribution just at the focal plane to begin with. So um, everything I showed you about this x, y, and z component uh, affecting the axial field also affects the transverse field, okay? So these are plots of uh, the irradiance distribution in the focal plane. So this is X versus Y. For the X polarized, Y polarized, and Z polarized component. And you can see that um, the distributions are very different and what you get, what you see in terms of excitation irradiance uh, is really just the vector sum of that. So this was a complicated problem again in that we're really concerned with what this overall irradiance distribution is, but we need to know how to shape all the three. So what we could do is we could take the same vector diffraction <coughs> integrals, here stated in a slightly different form, but these allow you to evaluate the field in x, y, and z. Um, and these are just uh, normalization um, coordinates that we use so that we can express uh, any position in the DOE field in terms of the normalized radius and any position within the focal plane in terms of a region in of interest and a complement outside. And what's important through all of this is kind of right down here that Really, what happens in the, tra in the, the, the pupil 
plane, and what happens in the focal plane is very, very intimately connected, okay? And it can be expressed as this parameter beta. And what's very interesting is it's kind of another example of the uncertainty principle. It basically says, if you want to shape the field at the focal plane, the smaller the features are that you try to obtain. If you try to, if you try to reshape a beam maybe that has uh, a width of a couple of lambda, that's actually much, much harder than trying to get a shaped beam that has a width of tens or hundreds of lambda. Okay? So the tighter the focus, the more difficult it is to shape. And conversely, the bigger the numerical aperture or the bigger your um, pupil plane field, the easier it is to shape the field. Why? Because you have a larger collection of k vectors whose interference can be used to shape the beam. So overall then, there's uh, a tension here because if you want to transform to a small focal spot which is shaped, it gets harder and harder and harder the lower the NA and the smaller the field distribution. And beta ends up, as I'll show you, expressing that difficulty because beta is connected both to the normalized radius here, the focal length, which can be connected to the numerical aperture, okay, and it's also connected to the lateral extent of what you're trying to shape in the focal plane. So the problem that we wanted to address was a simple one, just taking a flat top circular beam to uh, a square uh, beam and looking at how small that could actually be. And we still use method of generalized projections. We wanted to have a phase only diffractive optical element, but this time we allowed for analog solutions rather than binary. We used uh, iterative Fourier transform. We actually used a Chirbzy transform to go back and forth between the pupil plane and the uh, focal plane. And the last point is, how did we shape the field if we have to control the x, y, and z distribution? And what we did is use this little equation where we could propagate forward and get the local irradiance distribution. And what we would do is take the targeted distribution and actually subtract away what the real y and z polarized field is and use that to recalculate a new field distribution in x. So to propagate forward, we get the full x, y, z distribution. To go backward, all we did was propagate back the x polarization. And we reshaped the x based on what the real y and z polarized fields were. So rather than trying to force the y and z polarized fields to a particular solution, we used it to force x to where it needed to go in order to give a total irradiance distribution that was ideal. So we actually propagate only back the X field. And we could have done this with Y or with Z. You only need one to propagate back because the diffractive optical element shapes the X, the Y, and the Z field. Okay, so this is what we got. This is the total irradiance distribution in the case of a square flat top that was designed to be 50 lambda by 50 lambda. Um, and here are the breakdown of the X and the Y and Z polarized fields. And what you can see is that the X, which has most of the optical power, looks closest to a square top but rolls off quite a bit. And that extra intensity that we need to get a true flat top is provided in part by, mostly by the Z distribution and a little by the Y distribution. And these are all on the same normalized scales. So this irradiance goes from zero to one. The X goes from almost zero to one. You can see the uh, Z distribution goes from zero to about 0.6 here. So that's a much smaller total irradiance and the Y is much weaker. It goes from zero to 0.06. So most of the shaping is done by the complementary overlap of the X and the Z polarized fields. What does the DOE look like? This is kind of interesting, I think. This is the DOE profile uh, that, in fact, gives us a 25 by 25 square flat top beam. And what you can see is there's all these concentric rings in it. And if you look on the interior, there's kind of a fourfold symmetric pattern. So we want a fourfold symmetric uh, square top beam. So the diffractive optical element itself also has a fourfold distribution. This kind of makes sense for me as a chemist, because if you do uh, diffraction on uh, a crystal, you know, if you have a threefold symmetric crystal, you're going to get a threefold symmetric diffraction pattern. What's the significance of, all, significance of all of these rings? Can anyone tell me? What do these rings correspond to? They're changes in phase going from zero to two pi. So the phase is rolling over. Uh, it's at each of those intervals. Can you tell me what that's probably doing? Well, look at the size of the beam, right? It's, it's far from the diffraction limited focus, right? It's not lambda by lambda square. It's 25 lambda by 25 lambda. I have a high NA objective that without the DOE is capable of focusing very, very small, but I'm asking to reshape the beam to something that has a lateral extent that's much bigger than the diffraction limits beam. Basically what it's doing is it's compensating or working against some of the focusing power of the objective, right? So in fact, the bigger I, or sorry, the smaller I allow this beam to be, the less rings I'll have in general, and I'll show you that. This just shows how the diffraction efficiency and uniformity error were changing 
and this is something we evaluate to know when the uh, iteration is progressing and should be stopped. The diffraction efficiency is just how much optical power I really have in that square-shaped beam. It's never going to be 100%. And the uniformity error is just how many wiggles across the top we have, and we were able to evaluate that quantitatively by fitting it to a super-Gaussian, okay, and to evaluate the order of the super-Gaussian. So here's a whole bunch of square top beams, and you can see the progression now going from 25 lambda by 25 lambda down to something that's closer to the diffraction limit, 2.5 lambda squared. And what you can see is, yes, the number of rings decreases until eventually you get to something that's not compensating for the focusing power of the objective, it's just imposing that pseudo fourfold symmetric pattern to get a square beam. And you can also see that the uniformity is decreasing substantially. Here you see mostly red-orange scale, and across here you start to see a lot more red-yellow, red-yellow, which means that the intensity variation is much more significant. And if we evaluated uh, diffraction efficiency, uniformity error, uh, the squareness, this is an expression of the squareness of the profile, so the large spots, even 100 lambda by 100 lambda calculation we did, had a very high order super Gaussian that it would fit to, whereas when we got down to something closer to the diffraction limit, the order of the super Gaussian was a little bit smoother. And this is that beta parameter I was describing. What you can see is that the quality of the square beam gets worse and worse as I go down the series, okay? And n notably, for the very small beam, a much less optical power is within the square overall. And that's to be expected, because the beta parameter, I said, tells you something about your ability to beam shape, okay? And the smaller you go, um, the more difficult it is to reshape that irradiance distribution. And uh, Dickey, and Dickey is a real leader in this area, he and a coworker, Sheely, worked out this relationship that said, if I integrate the irradiance distribution at the input versus the irradiance distribution uh, that I'm targeting, and I weight it as a function of lateral position away from the optic focus, and multiply that by beta squared, that number is always going to be greater than one, which to me is very much like an uncertainty uh, parameter. So the closer this total integral gets to one, the more difficult it will be to achieve that beam shape, and the, more, uh, the lower the diffraction efficiency. And that was quantitatively you know, exactly what we, see, w what we saw. OK. So after all that, you can breathe a sigh of relief. I'm ready to summarize. So I hope I've convinced you um, that you know, vector theory is, is probably important when you're trying to do some high NA uh, beam shaping. Um, and I've shown you how we tried to do some of that, developing some methods that rely upon uh, method of generalized projections and particle swarm optimization. I'm just in love with this PSO technique. I think it's so cool. Um, but I also, uh, we've moved toward transverse beam shaping. Um, and if you want to get any more information about this, you can go to our webpage, and I have the references uh, for all of these papers. So I just want to thank my uh, research group, although Tufik Jabour did most of this work. Uh, some of my other grad students have helped with some of our uh, direct laser writing that uh, pushed us in this direction. So I have uh, three chem grad students um, shown here and uh, three undergraduates that work with me and even a high school student. So we have a, a lot of good interaction. And I want to acknowledge, um, in addition to my collaborators here, the funding that uh, keeps us going. And these are companies that helped us uh, get our lab set up with some pretty deep discounts. So I'm certainly grateful to them. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank my biggest contributors. These are the best results I showed so far. Those are the ones that keep me sane, or if he wakes up in the middle of the night, slightly insane. Um, but yeah, my family's letting me be on leave today, so I have to thank them. So thanks for listening to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Questions? Good. Adam, is that right? Yeah. When you talk about your DOE phase distribution, do you take into account the aberrations from the lens or your, the phase you get from the lens as well? That's a really good question. Um, th in our first run, we didn't. And I didn't show you experimental results. When we did make some DOEs, we had two issues going. One, we didn't quite fabricate them perfectly, off by a couple of microns. We have a paper where we discuss fabrication tolerance and how that affects things. Well, we didn't get our DOE perfect, um, but we noticed we weren't getting quite the irradiance distribution we wanted. So we started doing measurements, and we determined exactly what our zones were, our zone widths. When we put that back into the calculation to work out what irradiance distribution we should have, we still weren't getting what we saw experimentally. And so then we went and measured the phase aberrations of our objective. And I'll have, a, hopefully soon, a paper coming out that tells you the method that we used. Um, but when we corrected for those phase aberrations, kind of like having an additional second DOE that corrects for what the lens is actually doing. Then things fit quite well. Not perfectly, but quite well. So I, I think the, the answer is the, these objectives are really expensive, as you might know, like 5K for one uh, objective, which the manufacturers are quick to tell you are highly corrected. But they will never 
give you, at least I, I wasn't persuasive enough, they will never give you empirical data on what the aberrations are, nor will they really tell you how to go and measure them, nor do I think they really know. They kind of handpick these things, and you can maybe pay a little more and get a handpicked objective that's better, um, but I don't think you ever get rid of the aberrations. And our measurements said that they were on the order of like lambda over two, uh, max min. So that maybe sounds like a lot, but that's pretty good for 1.4 NA because some of the degree of curvature on a 13 lens, uh, 13 element objective uh, can be quite significant. So that's something I think you have to do. Um, and it, you know, it's an interesting question of how generally you could apply any of these methods because everyone's got a slightly different objective with slightly different aberrations. And so in the end, if you want to do this, maybe you've got to rush out and buy an SLM. I don't know. Yeah, but that's, that's something I'm thinking hard about. So it's a very good question. Another question, yes? So the intensity factors that we showed in the various parts of the method, um, the X, Y, and Z? The intensity patterns that I showed from? Uh, the last one that you showed in X, Y, and Z. Oh, oh, for the transverse beam shaping? Yeah. OK. Uh, the one before, yeah, this. this. So I, I might be an F9. Oh, um, well, I can, I, can tell you, I can tell you why the um, Z has a two-fold symmetry. I mean, if you think, if you just thought about what's happening in, let's say I had an X-polarized input beam, and I thought about the irradiance distribution in the XZ plane, then rays on the, on the maximum periphery of the lens would have the electric field vectors inclined in opposite angles. Okay? They'll both take on a Z component, but one is kind of pointing in the positive Z direction, and one is pointing in the negative Z direction. So when these interfere on the optic axis, they cancel each other out. So the Z distribution on axis has uh, no irradiance. As you move away from the, the optic axis, the Z component doesn't completely cancel out. So what that does is it generates a node in the irradiance distribution that makes it twofold symmetric. For the Y distribution, it's, uh, I, the, the simplest answer is I don't quite know, but I think it's the same kind of argument, really. So I can tell you why these two don't have the same symmetry. But I think it's the same idea. It's the degree of canceling that you have between the Y component that develops. Uh, and the Y component actually only develops um, in the uh, quadrants outside of the XZ and YZ plane. That's a good question. Yes? So maybe I'm a little confused. Should this algorithm assume that you're starting out from an early polarization? Yes. That's, that's just what we did. I mean, it's, go, go ahead, what were you saying? I was going to say, like, the, the first thing that I might think of trying if I wanted to get squeezing here, axially, would be uh, circularly polarized. Mm -hmm. anyway. Yep, that's the next step. Yeah, and you know, th that's, that's an extension, that's a straightforward extension of what we've shown here. And circularly polarized beams, it's just a linear combination of, of the two polarizations. Thank you very much. Thank you.